Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, and we are joined by the House Government Operations Committee as well. This afternoon, we're here to speak with uh, Commissioner Harrington from the Department of Labor and Director Cameron Wood on um, kind of giving both committees um, uh, a, what UI, what unemployment insurance is all about. Um, and I think uh, before we start that, we'll do introductions, but Commissioner, I think um, one place we sh probably should start um, right from the beginning is the antiquated um, IT system that we have and, um, and the problems that arise from that, uh, along with um, where we're going in the future and um, what we're looking at to, uh, to do those upgrades. So before we, we get to that, um, I'll ask my committee to introduce themselves and then uh, Chair Copeland Hanses, if uh, you would, you can take over um, and uh, have your committee introduce themselves as well. So um, to begin with, I'm Michael Marcott. I'm from Coventry. Um, I represent Coventry, Irisburg, Newport City, Newport Town, and I'm chair of the committee. And Charlie. Good afternoon. Nice to be with you all. Charlie Kimball from Woodstock, representing Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth, and the vice chair of the committee. Okay, and Stephanie. Good afternoon. I am Stephanie Jerome. I represent Brandon, Pittsburgh, and Sudbury, and I am the ranking member. Okay, Representative Dickinson is not with us this afternoon. She's from St. Albans Town, but um, she's back on the committee. Um, she started uh, on Commerce and went to uh, Corrections and Institutions and Judiciary and found her way back to Commerce. So we're glad to have her. Um, she's, she has uh, a lot of experience with UI too. Uh, and then we have uh, Representative Kitzmiller. Well, hello everybody. So yeah, I'm Warren Kitzmiller representing Montpelier uh, back on Commerce after what I think three bienniums up on GovOps. Uh, I miss my good friends on GovOps, but I'm very happy to be back on Commerce, which I gotta say feels more like a natural home to me. I was on this committee for 12 or 14 years, been around since the dawn of time. I, I've been around long enough that I remember when that unemployment insurance computer system was almost new. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll add that he's a former chair of this committee as well. Uh, Paul. Good afternoon, Paul Martin representing the Franklin Five District. I'm a first term legislator and I represent the towns of Franklin, Highgate, Berkshire and Richford. Nice to be here. Emma. Good morning all, Emma mulvaney Sanic. I represent Burlington's Old North End and New North End and I am a first term legislator, thanks. Logan. Good afternoon, uh, Logan Nicole representing Ludlow, Mount Holly and Shrewsbury. Uh, this is my second session. Last session, I was in human services. Michael. Hello there, uh, Michael Nigro. I represent Bennington, and I am also a first-term legislator. Patrick. I'm Patrick Seymour. I represent the towns of Sutton, Burke, and Linden. Uh, this is my second term. I was formerly on judiciary. Kirk. Good afternoon, I'm Kirk White. I represent the towns of Bethel, Rochester, Stockbridge, and Pittsfield. Uh, this is my first term as a legislator and I am clerk of the committee. And Amy. Hi everyone, Amy Tedisco. I am the committee assistant to House Commerce for the second year. That's the Commerce crew. Uh, so now, uh, Madam Chair, if you'd like to introduce your crew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am Sarah Copeland Hansis. I represent Bradford Fairley and West Fairley. Um, happy to be here with you today. Thank you to Director Wood and Commissioner Harrington for your willingness to come and help us uh, understand the uh, the ways that the UI system has been stress tested this year. And um, and uh, you know, of course, we. We have also appreciated your uh, your help in in uh, resolving constituent 
concerns and questions along the way. So thank you so much for being so responsive that way. Um, my vice chair, John Gannon. John Gannon representing Wilmington, Whitingham, and Halifax in the southern part of the state. Uh, Rob LeClaire. Um, good afternoon, Rob LeClaire. I represent Barry Town. Um, I guess I am the ranking member, and I have always been a member of the hardworking and talented Government Operations Committee. Bob Hooper. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bob Hooper from the new north end of Burlington, damn near Colchester. Um, my second term, government operations all the time and state employee beforehand. So um, that's my route. I got a call, I'd say about 23 minutes ago from a constituent who said, I'm having trouble with my unemployment. So this is timely. Thank you. Mike McCarthy. I'm Mike McCarthy. I represent St. Albans City and the southern part of St. Albans Town. Uh, and I am a third term legislator. I've served two terms on house transportation, so I'm new to GovOps. Hal Colston. Good afternoon. I'm Hal Colston. I represent Winooski and a small part of Burlington. Um, I'm in my second term and my second term on this committee. Mike Merwicki. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Morwicki. I'm one of two members of the Wyndham Ford District here down south in Wyndham, Wyndham County. I represent Putney, Dummerson, Westminster, and I wanna thank the commissioner um, for the help he has provided with many of my constituents and for, for making himself personally available uh, for us to contact them and, and help out some difficult situations. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Yes, good morning and welcome uh, commissioner. Uh, my name is Peter Anthony, of course, and I represent Barry City, together with one other seatmate. This is my first year uh, on this committee, second year in the legislature. Previously, I served on Ways and Means, and I thank your staff for intervening many times uh, to fix uh, uh, problems that have come up, and welcome. Tanya Vihovsky. Hi, thank you. I'm Tanya Vihovsky. I represent Essex Town. I'm a first term legislator and I also would like to thank you for the work that you have done to navigate this unprecedented time and look forward to continuing to work with you on how we go forward from here. Mark Higley. Thank you, uh, Mark Higley. I represent Lowell J. Westfield, Troy and Eden. I served eight years on GovOps in the past, a couple of years on uh, Ag and Forestry, a couple of years on Energy and Technology and Full circle back to GovOps. And Samantha Lefebvre. Thank you. I am Samantha Lefebvre. I am a first term legislator. I am a district mate um, for Orange County District 1, the towns of Chelsea, Corinth, Orange, Berkshire, Washington, and Williamstown. And I'd also like to send my thanks for all the work that you have done through this time. And our wonderful committee assistant, Andrea. Hi, good afternoon. This is my second session with the House Committee on Government Operations. I retired from the Department of Labor a few years ago. So hello to the Commissioner and Director. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. So Commissioner, um, thank you. If you'd like to kick it off, um, we welcome you, uh, you and Cameron here this afternoon. Thank you for giving us uh, some, some of your time. I know uh, you're extremely busy. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Michael Harrington, Commissioner, Department of Labor. Um, first of all, I'll uh, point out that I'm glad to see the name Michael uh, is strong and steady, even in the committees, um, as it is in the administration. Um, I will also point out, um, you know, many of you, uh, I, I do know, especially those on House Commerce, however, many of you I know by name only, uh, and that's uh, probably because of emails uh, we've exchanged uh, back and forth over the past year. Um, so I just, I will, you know, extend my thank you to you, um, you know, it, in, in totality, um, you know, 
this past year has been a challenging one, as you know, um, but, you know, each of you that have reached out to me have done so um, with compassion and understanding and a true desire to help your constituents and, um, and but you've been also um, very respectful and, and understanding of the pressures the department has been under. Um, and it's interesting because as we talk about this and do a year in review, um, you know, it's certainly not, uh, we are not at where we were maybe 10 months ago, um, but I think uh, because a lot of that uh, initial surge has passed, um, and, and I'm not complaining here, the, the light has been uh, maybe redirected to other areas like uh, vaccine rollout and distribution and maybe less so on uh, unemployment insurance. Um, but behind the scenes and probably not known uh, publicly so much is that um, we still operate uh, at um, a, a max level of capacity uh, and pressure on the system, both from a technology perspective, but also a staffing perspective. Uh, there is not a day that goes by that there isn't some uh, urgency or fire that needs to be put out on top of just the idea of needing to process the number of claims that come in each and every week. Um, and I say that really more as a recognition to the staff that works here at the department uh, who are still under a mandatory overtime um, uh, directive and have been working, um, you know, what is likely uh, 50 to 55 hours or more a week uh, and working well into the evening. Um, for example, we had even some of our staff working uh, at uh, three o'clock this morning as we try to beat the clock and deadline on issuing 1099s uh, to meet our federal obligations. So, um, you know, once we once we meet one obligation, there's usually another one uh, coming quickly behind it, whether it's a new program that needs to be launched or a new expectation, or even just part of our, our normal practice. Um, unemployment insurance is, is a pretty tricky situation. Uh, in many cases, you know, in conversations I've had um, with others, it can be one of, if not the most complex systems uh, out there with regards to requirements and eligibility, even more so in some cases than healthcare and Medicaid. Um, one of those reasons is because someone's eligibility for unemployment insurance is actually determined each and every week. So it's not like we issue a determination on eligibility that lasts that person the full range of their time on unemployment. They literally have to log in and recertify on a weekly basis for benefits. And anytime they're doing that, there's always the opportunity to create a circumstance where there's an issue uh, with either the information or the way the claim was completed. So, um, you know, every, every week um, we have new claims that need to be adjudicated that even could have been adjudicated multiple times in the past, but because the way they are filled out, it may cause a flag to be raised on a claim. So unlike any other program, eligibility occurs uh, each and every time someone files for benefits, which is on a weekly basis. I'll also say that until COVID-19, and many uh, of those who are familiar with the Department of Labor know this, um, you know, we, the administration of the program has been fully federally funded and is usually calculated based on volume. And that volume is traditionally tied to a state's unemployment rate. So being one of the states that has had the lowest unemployment rate uh, in the country leading up to the pandemic, we were extremely uh, thinly staffed, if you will, uh, leading in. And in some cases might say we were also severely understaffed and underfunded um, by the federal government leading into COVID-19. Uh, Cameron can share more, but at one point we had uh, in a division that traditionally runs about 65 to 70 employees, we had 25 vacancies, five of which were at the management level. 
uh, leading into COVID-19. So you can imagine the, the added pressure and burden that that put uh, on the unit right out of the gate. So, um, you know, lots, of, lots has happened uh, since COVID-19. There's been, uh, in, in many cases, the addition of what seems like copious number of fe uh, federal benefit programs all of which have needed to be created from scratch and stood up using a 50 year old mainframe and or a brand new piece of software never used by the department before. Um, so uh, we are not uh, any different than any other state. Uh, every state has found themselves in this situation. Um, federally, unemployment insurance turned 85 in 2020 uh, and I would uh, gather to say that during those 25 years, it changed very little. Uh, and, um, and yet in the year 2020, uh, it changed a whole lot. Uh, and a lot of that was shown through the various programs um, that came out in 2020 to provide added relief and, and necessary benefits for individuals in crisis. <laughs> It created uh, numerous challenges, and we can certainly jump right into to questions. Um, but as all of you have probably experienced, um, you know the the volume in which um, came through the door uh, was staggering. Uh, at any given time leading up to the pandemic, we operated our system with about anywhere from three thousand receiving benefits at any given time. Uh, during the spring, summer, and fall, it was usually closer to 3,000. During the winter season, uh, it was closer to 6,000. Um, even today, uh, we are issuing benefits to approximately 35,000 claimants. So even today, we are five times uh, more uh, volume than we were going into the pandemic. And at one point in the pandemic, uh, we reached uh, a total of issuing 90,000 claims uh, and paying out 90,000 claims to individuals. Uh, to date, we've received uh, over 130,000 initial claims for unemployment benefits. We've paid out more than $1.2 billion in benefits, uh, and that's across all the programs. And even today, we if you were to ask me if we are adequately staffed for the current or the future, I would say no. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of it is trying to find uh, talent and fill vacant positions. Other uh, pieces of that rely on uh, federal funding, which while there has been a lot of federal funding put aside for benefits um, to date, our state for just the administration of regular UI has received uh, about $3 million. Um, to put that in perspective, the Medicaid program in a quarter receives over $20 million. Um, so there, there is a big difference in terms of uh, the administrative funding that comes into uh, the department uh, to administer unemployment insurance. Um, so we've got a lot, of, a lot of different irons in the fire, if you will. Our staff um, are amazingly committed. We had um, probably, I would think, one of the highest um, uh, number of returning retirees uh, that came back to state government to help through this and they continue to help to this day. Um, but uh, we're certainly not out of the woods, um, but, but better than we were uh, back in April, May, June, and so on. So uh, I will just let Cameron um, fill in the blanks and whatever I misspoke on, and then we can get to questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I got to sit with the House Commerce Committee this morning, so happy to be back this afternoon. For the record, Cameron Wood, I'm the Unemployment Insurance Division Director for the Department of Labor. I'm really glad to be back with our House Commerce Committee and I'm glad to, to be able to sit in with House GovOps. It's been uh, many years since I've been in the Government Operations Committee. Uh, back when I was working with Legislative Council, I think may have been the last time, but I know some familiar faces, Representative Higley, LeClaire, others, um, you know, so happy to, to see you guys again. Um, 
Uh, I don't want to go on and, and add uh, too much more other than what the, the commissioner has has stated. I think um, very eloquent job kind of expressing the challenges that we've faced over the past year. Uh, I would just also add that uh, I know it has been uh, extremely frustrating for a lot of members with the legislature who are simply trying to help resolve issues for your constituents and Vermonters who are in, um, you know, what is usually one of the most difficult periods of time in their life. And, um, you know, I know it, it has been, you know, a, a frustrating time in some instances. Uh, we've, um, you know, had a lot of work on our plate over the past year. There's a lot of things that we can improve on, a lot of things that we can do better. Um, and we recognize that and we're always open to, to feedback and happy to be here to help answer some questions, to give some context as to, to sometimes where the system is, is designed that makes it sometimes not efficient, but also um, areas where we can improve as a department, I can improve, you know, with our division. But uh, I do want to echo what the commissioner mentioned, you know, which is just the sheer volume that that we've been able to administer. Uh, and that's just on the, the claimant side. You know, we also have uh, 24,000 employers that we're obligated to serve. And, um, you know, throughout 2020, we were still having to register businesses and, and um, you know, close business accounts down, collect unemployment contributions on a quarterly basis and collect the wage reports that come from employers. All of that is just as critical in the UI system to ensure that claimants are going out the door. So um, really try to take every opportunity that I get. I know the commissioner does as, as he just did, but really to thank our staff. Um, you know, they have been working overtime for coming up on now 12 months and um, really proud of the work that they've done. We haven't been perfect throughout the whole time, but you know, we've, we've I think really done, um, you know, a lot of work to help Vermonters and you know, the numbers I think speak for themselves. So um, really happy to be here. Um, really want to be helpful in, in, um, in providing context and information to you all so you can help make informed decisions. So uh, just know that we recognize that, um, you know, we, we are always here to try to improve on the process and, and help people. And, and that's uh, pretty rewarding that we do get to help people uh, and, and always want to make it more successful. So, uh, Commissioner, I, I thought everything you said was spot on. So uh, no need for, for any um, supplements there. And uh, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Cam. Uh, Commissioner, could, could you just, um, can you let us know anything about what you're hearing from the federal government um, as far as um, helping with um, providing new IT systems? Um, I know, and maybe it might be it might be good, uh, especially well for, for my new committee members and also for GovOps members um, to understand what happened with the consortium that we had uh, joined a few years ago, um, and give us a little bit of that history. Um, to and that was something that was to upgrade the IT system also. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the the UI mainframe uh, written in COBOL. Uh, turned 50 years old on June 9th of 2020. Um, we were not able to celebrate uh, given COVID, but um, you know, there, it's been a long standing desire, I think of the state and the department to upgrade this system. Uh, we're not the only state with an aging mainframe, but um, ours is of, I think, relatively more critical nature than many other states. Um, it's not necessarily a stable system. Um, and a lot of the, um, living history, if you will, in terms of, it, you know, it's one thing to know COBOL code, it's another thing to know how the system was designed and developed using that code and what changes have been made over the past 50 years and how the system functions. So, um, you know, it, in that respect, we have lost a lot of the, the historical knowledge uh, through retirements and attrition here at the department. Um, and that has really handicapped our ability to, um, you know, effectively manage this mainframe system. We've done a great job, um, but every day is a challenge. Uh, and um, I could run you a laundry list of challenges we ran into just this week, um, but every week is the same. 
Um, we were in a consortium. We've been in two consortiums uh, in the past. We were in a consortium uh, up until February of 2020. Um, we received federally, federal funding for that consortium. Uh, we were in it with the state of Idaho and the state of North Dakota. Um, we got to the point in the consortium where we had essentially depleted all of our federal funding and we're going to need to start using state funding uh, and also reached a point where it was very clear that um, the solution we were getting uh, that was being uh, produced for us was not of high enough quality and to our standards, um, nor was it going to be delivered on time. And so it really got, uh, it really became a question of, of funding and trajectory. Uh, and by the time uh, we didn't necessarily, I, I don't wanna say we stepped away from the consortium, but I will say the three members um, had many uh, very honest conversations. And in the end, uh, the governors of those three states decided to dissolve the consortium and go their separate ways. Uh, at the time of disillusion, uh, we were still looking at probably another 18 months uh, before going live. So even if we had stayed in the consortium, it would have done us no good with regards to COVID-19. Uh, we were still a year and a half away. Uh, we still, having been in the consortium for four years, had not received uh, a fully functioning uh, piece of, uh, of code that we could test from end to end. Um, and so we would get bits and, and pieces that would run in and of themselves, but when put together, we still had not been able to fully do an end-to-end -end test on um, the system that was being provided. Uh, and it left us um, you know, very concerned about the quality of the code we were receiving, um, the, the lack of documentation, and really the way the project was, was being run. And so uh, as a state, we decided to uh, to step away. Um, if you remember the first uh, draft of the HEROES Act back in August of 2020 uh, held uh, a lot of funding for UI modernization. However, the most recent um, bill that a relief bill that was actually passed had no money for modernization in it. Um, I think part of that was just the desire to make sure our benefit programs continued to fund benefits for claimants. Uh, and obviously, you know, for any of us watching the news, we know that there is a desire to come back with additional um, relief packages in the coming weeks, months, and years, I'm assuming. Um, and, and I know that it, it remains a, a top priority uh, for for the states uh, and for our national association for state workforce agencies. Um, but to date, there has been no federal funding uh, provided to states for modernization since COVID-19. Thank you. And I believe, um, I think in that last consortium we were in, I think, wasn't it Idaho that was actually the controlling state of the of the three yeah it was a unique situation in this case um you know what we've seen in other consortiums is you know two or more states get together they identify a third party vendor to produce the product uh in this case um you know three states got together and there were other states that had come and gone out of that consortium um, but in this case there were these three states and idaho was the lead state uh, doing the production. That was mainly because there was a, a 1.0 version that was released in Idaho. Um, and so that we were enhancing the system that they had already built once and deployed. Um, I'll tell you though, it's very different to deploy a system in, a st in your own state using your own statute and your own system, which you know intimately, than providing code and and standing it up in another state. Uh, and I think that's where we ran into a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues. So we ended up with Idaho as the lead state, which also meant they received most of the funding, uh, which also tied the other states in the consortium, Vermont and North Dakota, in um, tied their hands in their ability to actually make uh, meaningful decisions involving how the system was built and deployed. 
um, because in the end, the state that owned the code and the state that had all the money um, really was able to, to drive the train in the direction they wanted to go. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Commissioner Harrington. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. I mean, the, the unprecedented volume, the 130,000 initial claims for the state uh, and the problems of processing that, I'm trying to figure out the degree to which the computer system itself uh, presented a log jam or a problem. Um, and uh, then the second part of the question is, Going forward, I, I hope you're not suggesting that we hold on to the same system, that we definitely need to change that. And the third part of that is, what do we need to do in order to do that? Because it's not in the governor's recommend uh, to spend a few million dollars on a new system. Um, so just could you give us a little history on that? Sure. So I think it might help to um, for me to kind of put things in perspective. So what we ended up having to do as part of our response to the pandemic was really jerry-rig or daisy chain various systems together. Um, so leading up to um, COVID-19, unemployment insurance over the years had gone from a face-to-face -face interaction to here in Vermont and over the phone interaction and very little uh, interaction was done online. Weekly filings were done online, but for someone to actually open a claim, they had to call and talk to a claims representative who could walk them through their opening of their claim. So we didn't actually have an online form for them to fill out uh, when uh, COVID hit. So that became our initial action was how do we get a system in place that can take a claim over, you know, over the internet. And so it comes in uh, through a Salesforce application. That claim is then checked against or run through our mainframe uh, to determine whether or not the claimant is eligible for regular unemployment insurance. So are they monetarily eligible? Uh, for regular unemployment insurance? Are they uh, eligible because of their uh, le separation circumstance for regular unemployment insurance? And if not, then they are then offered the opportunity to fill out the PUA application. Um, and that is partially because of the federal requirement that someone must be deemed, uh, if, if someone is deemed eligible for even $1 of regular unemployment insurance, they cannot be eligible for PUA. And so um, there is a cross check that has to happen before someone can receive PUA benefits to make sure they didn't fit into the regular UI program first. Um, so there is a lot of back and forth of data between multiple systems. Um, when we talk about modernization of the UI system as a whole, if you were to ask me today, what do you need and how long would it take? it would likely take somewhere between two to three years uh, to design, develop, implement, uh, and, and roll out. Um, and it would probably cost somewhere uh, between 25 and $35 million. Uh, and so when we talk about funding for a program, um, you know, when the governor is, is recommending um, a few million dollars, really what he's doing is breaking uh, the modernization up into phases that can be completed within a 12 month budget cycle. Uh, and so um, it would do us no good to allocate um, $40 million uh, in a budget cycle because we wouldn't be able to spend it all within the 12 month budget cycle uh, if it was one time funding. So we have broken the, the modernization up into multiple phases. Uh, and we'll be funding phase by phase. I think in the end though, the hope would be that um, the federal government comes through with modernization dollars for all states that are in need. Um, but you know, I, I also think we cannot hope and, and pray for that to happen in a timely fashion. We have to make sure we've got a plan in place in case it doesn't happen. Cameron, uh, I see you have stuff to add. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to provide a little more context to to what happened in the very beginning, um, because, you know, I really see it as a combination of not having individuals 
available, but I really do think there was a lot of compounding systematic system problems that had to be identified, prioritized, and then, you know, addressed. And so uh, I really want to take a quick moment and dive a little deeper into what the commissioner identified there with the, the daisy chain analogy. Um, you know, as the commissioner mentioned, you know, prior to the pandemic, we did not have online access. It was telephone. And the, the benefit there is it allows us to um, prevent more fraud if individuals have to actually call and provide information. Um, but it also gave us the opportunity to have that conversation with a claimant to say, here are your next steps. Here's what you can expect in the mail. If there's an issue on your claim, here's the issue that we've identified on your claim, you're going to need to go into adjudications and here's an expected turnaround time. So it, it gave us that opportunity to provide that level of communication. Um, what, what happened very quickly was we were overwhelmed with volume that was entirely unmanageable. I mean, I would say even today, I don't know with the staffing levels that we have, if you, I mean, keep in mind, it was, it was over the weekend and at the very beginning of a week where it was announced that all essential businesses would be closed. And, you know, so we had, we went from taking, you know, 500 calls a day with the claim center that we had to, you know, by the time we were able to stand Maximus up, you know, commissioner, I think we had well over 100,000 phone calls hitting our systems a day. And so um, the, the problem there was, you know, not only as the commissioner mentioned, did we have to identify getting an initial application stood up online, and then how do you take that information with a 21st century web application and feed that information into a mainframe system? But then we're, then we're in a position where because you know, that was delayed, because it had to be built, we now have all of these individuals that need to potentially go into the claimant portal and file back weeks of claims. Our claimant portal was not designed to do that. Our claimant portal is only designed to allow someone to file for the, the prior week. So for the committee here, uh, I'm going to try to, to, I mentioned this to the commissioner before we jumped on, I'm try to try to um, explain when we hit UI things. So the way UI works is you're always filing for the previous week. So when you're filing this week, you're actually filing to, to say that you were unemployed last week. And our system was designed even for the weekly certifications to only allow one back week. And if you got behind in filing, you had to pick up the phone and call the claim center in order to get caught up. Why do we have that? Because our rules only allow for the backdating of one week and it's a fraud prevention mechanism. So if somebody gets behind in filing and they call us, we get to say, well, why didn't you file your claims? Is it because you weren't doing a work search? Is it because you're not able and available? So it's a, it's a, it's a fraud tool to prevent uh, in individuals who are not eligible. So, so then we run into a situation where we get the online claim stood up, but now we have, you know, tens of thousands of people who need to have their claim backdated, who we have to go in and fix the claimant portal to allow them to go in and file those back weeks. So um, on top of that, you know, we're, we're trying to stand up a call center with, you know, 200 plus agents many of whom have zero understanding of unemployment insurance, you know, and so um, I just wanted to, I guess, dive a little bit deeper into that to, to, to really emphasize that, you know, we were, as every state across the country was entirely overwhelmed with numbers that just are not manageable. Um, you know, the system, the, the mainframe actually did what it was supposed to do. Um, the problem is the ancillary systems were not designed to allow this volume and to allow individuals to do what needed to be done to catch up. 
And then on top of that, you had a lot of individuals who did not understand the unemployment insurance system, did not understand how it works. And so they were answering questions incorrectly that would traditionally flag for us the need to investigate. And, you know, unfortunately, we, we tried in the middle of the moment to, you know, course correct for people to provide them direction of how to answer questions correctly. Uh, and, and they were still tripping all over themselves. Um, on top of that, we had not only individuals who were eligible for unemployment who had lost their job, but we also had the tens of thousands of self-employed people who were trying to file for unemployment who were never going to be eligible for regular UI. And so uh, unfortunately it was, you know, a hundred thousand people, you know, trying to access a system all at the same time and the department, um, you know, trying as quickly as we could to get a contractor staff set up uh, and trying to get them trained as quickly as we could on unemployment and, and the parameters of unemployment, how it works. So um, I just, yeah, I just wanted to take that time to extrapolate on that a little bit because it was um, uh, an, an insurmountable challenge in my opinion. Thank you. Representative Hooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner Director. Um, it, I originally wanted to ask about uh, why or if our cadre of laws is so different from other states that we couldn't buy something off the shelf that some other state is already using and make it functional uh, beyond the hardware problem. But uh, Commissioner Harrington, in your opening remarks, you took me way off into a different uh, stratosphere. So I'm going to ask you something that might seem a little odd uh, because we're looking at things that are kind of past performance, and I want to talk to you about looking forward in the personnel aspect, uh, and it's a little obscure, I'll admit. Um, as you probably know, budget-wise, we're having significant problems retirement-wise, uh, and Treasurer Pierce has put a proposal forward that many employees are looking at as sort of draconian, and there's a lot of conversation about, I'm going to get out before I get either more time to work or less benefit to, to live on. Uh, are you aware at this point, because you've, you've said that initially you were short staffed, you were overwhelmed, you're still working overtime. How many employees do you have that are within that five year window that they could buy themselves out and walk out the door tomorrow? And if that happened, how decimated would the agency be? And Generally, since your your staff contains a lot of specialized skills, how long would it take you to recover? Yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, great question. Um, it is it is somewhat of a concern um, in that it really it really depends. I haven't done a full analysis of all two hundred and fifty employees within the department or the seventy five state employees that work within the UI division. Um, I, I do know it will impact some, um, you know, the, it's, it's not necessarily the total number, it's how many occur in, in one area or two areas. Um, and I think there are at least at the top of my mind, uh, two or three individuals that may take that option. Uh, and if they did so, it would uh, leave us in a very tough position. Um, I think when we talk about recovery of department resources, you know, a lot of people are even asking, you know, why can someone still call the claim and assistance center and, um, and get bad information? Um, and I was having a conversation with colleagues from other states the other day, you know, it, it takes roughly a year uh, of intense training and one-on-one -on -one coaching just for someone to become comfortable in administering the UI program. And it probably takes somewhere around two to three years to actually become a subject matter expert in administering unemployment insurance. So the fact that we 
stood up a call center in two weeks and then received questions as to why these people don't know what they're talking about. Um, you know, it, it, was obvious, it was obvious to us on this end why. Um, and I think even so, um, you know, when we're talking about refilling ranks, um, it's, a, it's going to be a long time. Uh, and by long, I mean, you know, three to five years before we can um, build up the knowledge base that I think either will be lost or has been lost over the past um, four years, even just since I've joined the department. Um, and so we, we are moving in that direction. Um, but again, you know, it, it takes a significant amount of time to actually get an individual to be a subject matter expert in the field of unemployment insurance. I hope that answered your question. If not, I can expound. Yeah, it did. I have a follow-up though. You also mentioned, I mean, when this first hit, I put out a, a plea uh, to retirees to, you know, if you're sitting around, you're not in Florida, consider going back to help. How many uh, responses in that line did you get? I never. Really uh, I So Cameron, you're probably better to answer this. You know, even just, we had employees that had just retired um, who immediately walked back through the door. We had an employee who retired over the summer of COVID and then started working temporarily uh, after her retirement um, from, remind me, set North Carolina, Florida, uh, Colorado. Um, you know, so we have people across the country um, who are still uh, helping to administer the Vermont UI program. Yeah, very, very quickly, I'll, I'll add to that. I, every recent retiree that I can think of is currently working for the UI division. Every individual who has recently retired, and when I say recently, I would say within the past 12, you know, 12 to, to 18 months, um, is has most of them voluntarily offered to come back. Um, it, it is amazing to me uh, the dedication that some of these individuals have to their jobs, um, you know, and, and the work that we do here. So um, really, really excited that a lot of them did offer to come back. Um, most of them reached out to us asking if they could come back. And the ones that have retired over the past year during COVID have elected to stay on uh, in a temporary capacity um, to, to assist us. And um, Representative Hooper, if, if I may, I'll try to be very quick because I imagine some of the other committee members may have your first question. Um, as the commissioner mentioned in the beginning of his comments, you know, unemployment insurance is extremely complex. And, um, you know, USDOL, uh, it's a federal state partnership. And I've heard the number thrown around 75 to 80 percent of the unemployment insurance program is equivalent across the states. That that may be true. Um, there are functions that we all are required to adhere to because it's in federal law. But and there are certain you know, units that all of us have to have. We all, we all interact with employers. We all have a program integrity function, but the, you know, the, the 25 to 30%, uh, 20 to 30% that is different is extremely different and very complex. Um, as we were just talking with the House Commerce Committee this morning, uh, just looking at something like disregarded earnings, which is treated entirely different in New Hampshire than it is Vermont. In Vermont, it's 50% uh, of your earnings are disregarded. In New Hampshire, I believe it's 30%. Um, and so, you know, one would think, well, it's just a percentage, but um, when it comes to what wages are reportable, uh, what employers are reportable, um, how that interacts, as the commissioner mentioned earlier, every week is a review of the claim. And, um, and so there's just, it's, it, it does get very complex. And unfortunately, um, there aren't many, um, you know, large IT vendors that operate in this space. And, um, you know, there aren't many that 
are consistently successful in taking a system and implementing it in different states. And so it just, it, unfortunately, it, it's not a situation where we, we can take something off the shelf. It, it does require a lot of individualized tweak to, tweaks to get, it, to get it into production. I think um, if I would add just one thing I have learned is that um, the federal government requires states to do many things, mm -hmm. but they leave it to the states to determine how they do it. And so a good example is the required work search. So Great. under the federal definition, every state must have a work search, but they leave it to the states to define what, a, what their state work search requirement will be. And so if you can imagine, there are probably 50 different types of work searches out there in terms of what is considered a successful work search requirement by state. Um, I think the other thing I would also point out is the changes that even occurred in the system just in the past 12 months um, are, are substantial. So every state's response to COVID-19 was different based on the state and the sectors that were impacted and the types of populations that were impacted. So every state responded differently uh, to COVID-19. Um, now they may have done somewhat similar things, but down at the micro level, um, those things actually are very different from one state to the next. Thank you both. Yes, sir. Representative Mulvaney Stanick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, the letter was submitted earlier this week to the House Commerce Committee, and I know it's posted on our website from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, and it raised, I mean, part of the problem here today is that we're thinking about the, trying to be high level, think about the systems, think about IT, for example, things will improve the system whenever, whatever day it is we get out of the pandemic. Of course, but there were some pretty concerning um, concerns in that letter that Vermont Legal Aid raised. I, mean, I believe a copy was sent to the commissioner a couple of weeks ago, so you're probably familiar with it, commissioner. Yes. Um, and I know I at least have received, even just two days ago, constituents who echo the concerns in, in the legal aid um, uh, letter that were raised. And so I'm just curious, um, how how is the department dealing with what seems to be, can't be just my district, um, the backlog of delayed payments, either through the um, PUA program or just the regular UA program, as well as um, just claimant decisions seem also to be backlogged. And I can understand why, but in terms of remedy, um, I'm just curious how we're gonna get there so that Vermonters aren't left in limbo. I have one constituent who still has um, approved claims that hasn't received a payment since July, and that's a very long time to wait. So I will say, um, I will caveat everything and I will, I will give one ask of the committee and I wish I could ask the, the uh, media outlets to do the same. Um, and that is, remember that there are three sides uh, to every claim situation. There is the claimant's perspective, uh, there is the employer's perspective, and there is the department's perspective. And so um, what we traditionally find is that um, whether it's uh, from a legislator or from a special interest group or from um, you know, uh, the media, when they take uh, one side of a claim or one perspective of a claim, that is only one third of the information actually um, specific to that claim. And so um, when you say, you know, I have a constituent who hasn't been paid since July, um, you know, there are a lot of different factors that may go into that. Um, I can tell you that there really are not outstanding claims um, from July in the sense that the, the department may have already issued an initial determination on that claim, either telling an individual to, that they are eligible or ineligible for benefits. And if the, uh, that individual then chooses to 
appeal that decision, um, there are actually three levels of appeal within the appeal process. It's a quasi-judicial process. Um, there are administrative law judges. There's sworn testimony under oath. There is collection of evidence. Um, the first level of appeal goes to an administrative law judge. The second level of appeal goes to uh, an appointed employment security board. And the third level can go all the way to the Vermont Supreme Court. And so when you say there may be someone uh, from July who, uh, whose uh, claim has not been paid, um, it may be that the department has already issued its position on the claim, um, but either the claimant or the employer is now contesting the claim and now it is moving through the appeal process. And if you take the appeal process from beginning to end, that, that could take many months, um, if not a year, uh, to move through all three levels of the appeal process. Uh, within the department, um, we essentially have two, two areas where we um, issue a more comprehensive determination on a claim. The first is adjudications and that happens within the UI unit. So I should say first, a claim comes in, there's an initial determination done based on the reason for separation, or um, whether someone is monetarily eligible, meaning they've, they've earned enough wages to be eligible for UI. The, the, um, the mainframe actually calculates using an algorithm somebody's determination, and they may then receive a determination from the department saying, your weekly benefit amount is zero because you have not earned enough wages to be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, we then have an adjudications unit, which will do um, fact finding on uh, the specifics of a particular claim. Um, we fluctuate anywhere from at the height of the pandemic, um, more than 90 days uh, in adjudications from the date a claim enters adjudications to the date it leaves adjudications. Um, and, uh, and at the low part, uh, we were able to get down to um, less than a 30 day uh, turnaround. However, I believe right now we're hovering somewhere around 45 days to 60 days, which all has to do with volume uh, and, um, and the number of claims coming in. So when we reached our high point in um, uh, the season with seasonal unemployment, that number jumped back up to probably closer to 45 to 60 days. Um, but there is fact finding that happens both at the claimant and the employer level in those cases. And to reference the point in here, um, you know, the, the legal aid um, actually makes a statement to prioritize uh, uh, adjudication of claims with qualified claim and experienced claims adjudicators. And that is the part that is um, harder to achieve because uh, we, can, I, we can anoint anybody to be a claim adjudicator, whether they are actually um, qualified to adjudicate claims is a very different um, scenario. So in, in these cases, we have our most experienced individuals adjudicating claims um, that come in uh, through the door. Once we issue a determination from an adjudicated claim, the claimant and the employer have appeal rights and either one, and in, in, in some cases, the department also has an appeal right to some extent as well. Uh, and so um, once we start the journey down the appeal process, um, that is a totally different avenue that happens within our appeals division outside of the unemployment insurance process and comes with its own set of legal standards um, you know, to, to follow. So again, you know, when you ask about backlogs, we do have individuals who are in appeals or in adjudications. Um, the average turnaround time is somewhere around 45 to 60 days at the moment. Our goal is to be under 30 days, um, but we also had to reallocate some staff over the past few weeks to another uh, area um, of urgent need. Um, and so there are only so many skilled UI specialists to go around. Um, and so we do tend to have to redirect staff each week to whatever the priority is. 
And that priority could be um, a claimant priority, it could be a federal government priority, or in some cases it could be an audit priority, depending on uh, what's happening um, either here or uh, at the federal level. So um, there are many different components to those. Um, I think the other piece I would add is, you know, in appeals, uh, we, we run somewhere between 60 and 90 days um, from the date of an appeal uh, to the date of a hearing. Um, and a determination is usually issued the following week. Um, you know, there are, I will also say there are, there are thousands, hundreds if not thousands of claims that go to adjudications each week and hundreds uh, of appeals that go to appeals each week. So, um, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, how quickly can we turn around, um, you know, there, there's a limit on how, how fast that can happen with, their, with the skilled and qualified resources we have. Um, I did look through the letter from legal aid. Um, you know, there are five areas that they identify and, and I uh, plan to provide legal aid with a written response um, to those five areas. You know, the first asks us to devote staff time to clearing the backlog of initial claim determinations. Um, I will say that there there really isn't a backlog of initial claim determinations, but it depends on how you define determination. So they are issued an initial determination relatively quickly, unless they have answered in a way that has caused their claim to go to adjudications, or if we are provided details from their employer that caused their claim to go to adjudications. Um, the second asks that we expedite review by trained adjudicators to minimize delay in the adjudication process and the issuance of claims. I can tell you that um, all of our skilled and trained adjudicators are adjudicating cases right now, uh, and we have added to those ranks uh, over previous weeks. Um, the third asks that we uh, cease recoupment and collection of all contested overpayments until after an administrative law judge decision is issued and asks that the administrative law judge waive collection of overpayments when the claimant is without fault. Uh, I will say that anytime we are legally allowed to waive overpayments, we have if the if the claimant is not at fault and if the overpayment was a result of an action by the department, However, only until recent federal guidance have states been allowed to waive overpayments of federal benefit programs. And so in many cases early on, um, the, the state was not allowed to waive overpayments of federally paid benefits. Um, to the first part of that, uh, we do have a statutory obligation for how we um, identify overpayments. Uh, and, uh, and how we recoup those overpayments. And the way we do that is in line with current statute. The fourth uh, asks that we allow 60 day appeal deadline during the state of emergency. And while the department remains uh, inconsistent in its ability to respond to direct inquiries and schedule appeal hearings in a timely manner. I will, along those lines, I have asked about what it would take to extend uh, the, uh, the what is currently a 30-day appeal deadline uh, to a 60-day appeal deadline. And uh, based on the information I've received, I believe it will take a statutory change um, to allow that to occur. Um, I will say that um, one thing that's of interest is that the time it takes to turn around an adjudicated claim is actually currently roughly the same time it took to turn around an adjudicated claim prior to the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, from that perspective, our staff has done an amazing job making sure that we didn't exceed the amount of time that we were at going into the pandemic. Um, and then finally, uh, they ask that, uh, or they state that they would support resources to the department to increase staffing and training. And while in, in theory, I think Cameron and I would both agree that we would support any additional staff and training, um, but with that comes uh, a, a resource cost. And, and like I said, at, 
at the moment, you know, we are really resource constrained, not just on the staff side, but on the finance side, um, with very limited federal dollars coming in to administer these programs. Um, you know, there is, at, leading into COVID-19, the entire UDI department was made up of 70 staff people. Like I said, we had a 25 person vacancy uh, in that area. Uh, and we had a total department budget for unemployment insurance of $6.5 million. And so we were running our entire UI department on $6.5 million annually, um, which is not much uh, given uh, having uh, 60 employees working in that, in that area. So, uh, and along with, that includes not just staff, but overhead um, maintenance and operation of, of equipment and software and the mainframe uh, and all the ADS staff and support that goes into ensuring the operation of those systems. So again, 6.5 million was not a lot. Um, and so, and to date, we've only received about $3 million in additional, um, I would say, undesignated or unobligated um, above base funding for UI administration. So again, I, I think we, we would certainly support that and we support everything that is in um, this letter, um, but there are certain um, requirements, restrictions, considerations um, that come with each of those um, that hopefully I've been able to outline here today. Cam, uh, feel free to jump in. I would love to get a word in at some point because that was a very long answer. So Cameron, if it's sure. relevant back to my first question, that's fine, but I would love to get the floor back at some point. Yeah, just I, just very quickly, I was just gonna add that, um, you know, I think the it's compounded by the new programs, especially the PUA program. Um, you know, PUA is brand new. It, you know, did not exist prior to March and even to date. I mean, I send emails uh, very frequently to USDOL asking about PUA eligibility because um, it, it is not very clear. Um, you know, USDOL holds us to account for administering the program correctly. And um, it's just, there are so many nuanced situations for both self-employed and individuals who aren't eligible for regular UI as to whether they meet PUA eligibility. And so, um, you know, I just, I know that there are some situations where those determinations can take a while, usually because we're trying to get the right answer from USDOL. As the commissioner mentioned, um, we were very, very hesitant to want to put someone into PUA, backdate them all the way to March, pay them, you know, $30,000, $20,000 to find out you weren't eligible. And the guidance at the time was they have to pay every dime of that back. There were no overpayments. The federal guidance even said, even if it's department error, PUA dollars must be paid back. So, um, I, I recognize, I know the commissioner does too, that, you know, there, there could be situations where um, someone uh, may have received a determination and, and may not be aware of it, or there could be some nuance there. So uh, in, in turning the floor back over to you, Representative, I just will say too, um, if you have a constituent who feels like they haven't uh, been given service or it's not clear as to where they are, please send that to myself and the commissioner. Um, I will take a quick opportunity to plug the commissioner here just to say, I know that he works with our assistant UI director every single evening to go through claimants and troubleshoot them and try to get them back. So, um, you know, I, I know the commissioner did a good job there of expressing the nuance, but if you have somebody in that situation, send it to us because I know the commissioner makes that his, his top priority. So. Thank you. And I did send that through Dustin through the governor's office a couple of days ago. Okay. So in theory, this constituent is in your hands now um, again. And I just, I, you know, I see, I see the job of representatives, of course, as well as I'm sure all of you, and we're all here for the same purpose to make sure that Vermonters um, have a fair shake at accessing benefits and navigating a lot of red tape of brand new programs that yes, are complicated and doing things carefully. I completely am on the same page for that. And, um, you know, I make no assumptions about my neighbors and, and their cases. This woman is a self-employed person. So that takes one of the triangle sides out. So 
she's the one source for two of those three points you, you made earlier, Commissioner, about all the complications of adjudicating a claim. And I'm just also still still hold some concern around you know, using the call center and um, I forget what you said, uh, Director, but I think you said something along the line, you know, the challenges of people who have to quickly get up to speed on a very complex system that is different in every state. And I'm sure Maximus does this for 49 or 50 states or whatever it might be. Um, it puts Vermonters right into yet another gap. If they get told the wrong answer and they get flagged, mm -hmm. then they're kicked into a totally different queue. And I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to about those Vermonters and wanting to remedy that scenario so those mm -hmm. folks aren't left in limbo because they call back five or six times and they get the wrong answer, which you've said has happened, and helping those folks navigate it. I think that's I think all the of the representatives on this in this hearing can agree to that. So that's where I'm coming from and seeking. So um, thanks for hearing me out on that piece. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Representative Representative Vahoski, if I said that right. Did great, thank you. Um, thank you. I am curious, given that this system is so complicated and there was a understaffing even before the pandemic, what the plans are and what supports are needed to train and retain staff. As you've said, it takes years to get someone to the point where they're not making mistakes. So how do we best do that going forward and learn from where we're at now? Yeah, uh, one of the biggest challenges um, right now is is the unknown, right? And so um, originally when we were looking at the height of the pandemic, we didn't know how long it was going to last, right? Was it gonna last weeks? Was it gonna last months? Is it gonna last two years? Um, which makes planning and preparing for staffing very difficult um, because these are also all people you, um, have made an obligation to in terms of employment to then turn around and if if things change, either um, you're required to retain them or you're asking them to to leave um, employment as well. Um, but the I would say the biggest and Cam jump in here if I'm wrong, but the the biggest challenge right now is the unknown with regards to long term administrative funding. And so USDOL is um, really great at, you know, giving one-time money um, and they don't give a lot of it, but when they do, it's typically one time um, with a very short um, life expectancy. And so that has been, in my mind, our biggest challenge. Um, you know, it's one thing to receive funding. It's another thing to receive um, continued funding um, that would support long-term employment. Um, so that's, that is my biggest challenge. Cameron? Yeah, I, I will echo the commissioner exactly. That, that, that is exactly what I would say. Um, you know, our program, unfortunately, is, is entirely federally funded. We, we uh, in the past, have not, we've tried to manage as best we can without having to come to the state to ask for additional dollars for administrative purposes. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, the, the funding ebbs and flows with the workload. And uh, we have always been understaffed as far as I've been here. Uh, we're fortunate that we've never had to lay anyone off. But as the commissioner mentioned, you know, before the pandemic, we were in a kind of a, a vacancy saving, you know, perspective to try to, to manage to our budget. The other challenging thing is, um, that puts us kind of at the whim of the federal government as far as when they when they decide to pass a budget. As I know you all are, are aware, sometimes that is the day before, <laughs> hours before their budget expires. Um, you know, and it's only on a one year cycle. Sometimes it's on a three month cycle. Um, you know, we were we were our admin budget for this program year was a reduction from what it was last year. So we're in the middle of a pandemic with numbers that we've never seen before uh, and, and our budget was cut. And so um, it, right now I'm looking at it, you know, we're doing the best we can to staff up and, and trying to find every single avenue of funding that we have available to help support us. But, um, you know, I'm looking at a budget deficit right now, we are. And so it's very challenging to, you know, ramp up more staff than, than what we're trying to pull in right now. So um, 
and and it becomes increasingly challenging to recruit individuals in those situations because a lot of a lot of positions we we receive are potentially temporary which doesn't come with you know benefits uh, attached to that and uh, it's it's difficult to maintain individuals in those positions uh, we have received limited service positions that we're trying to recruit for um, keeping in mind too you know it's it's just another piece of the puzzle that we have to think about, um, you know, let's say we fund someone's position for, for six months to 12 months, when we have to let that individual go, because maybe we have a funding decrease, uh, we're then responsible for that person's unemployment benefits. And so we have to calculate that out because we're a reimbursable employer as the state of Vermont. So when we lay those individuals off, we have to anticipate then having to pay out the unemployment for that individual. So, um, which naturally we should, I'm not here to say we shouldn't, but it just, that's a, a added cost, um, you know, for a program that we have no input with the federal government as far as what our budget is. And so, um, you know, I, I think we have been able to, uh, find a lot of, um, you know, talented individuals and individuals that, you know, we have been able to bring to the team over the past few months. Um, but it, the challenge in, in retaining the, um, you know, the, the breadth of staff that we need for a program is always going to be, as the commissioner mentioned, it's long-term stable funding sources. Well, US I, will, I, would, I was just going to say, I would add Cameron to that, you know, the, when you have programs where you don't know how long they're going to last, like yep. PUA, um, you know, so probably 40, 40 to 45 percent of our operations right now are PUA specific. Um, and and honestly, under the first relief package that was supposed to end at the end of last year and then got renewed for 11 weeks. Right. So and and it's possible it will get renewed again. My guess is we won't know that till the eve uh, or after the expiration of the program, like last time, um, that that makes challenging. Uh, and and so states, I would just I would just finish on this. For me, you know, states I think across the country are really frustrated with this, uh, frustrated with the funding model um, that USDOL uses to provide us our admin dollars. And um, you know, I know one of our our, our national association. It's called NASWA. They are um, you know really understanding this and keen on this and trying to advocate for us at the federal level changes needed. And, and I would just add that I think we're trying to have that conversation internally as well, which is, you know, how can we, um, you know, how can we better utilize what we have and, and kind of try to stabilize our funding sources moving forward in the future because you know it, it, it is extremely challenging to uh, to manage and budget to, to cycles that sometimes are, are one month at a time with the federal funds that we have. Thank you. Representative Kitzmiller. I think my questions are much shorter. I'm, I'm really interested in the health of our trust fund at the moment. Where do we stand? Do we still have some money of our own in there? Are we borrowing heavily from the feds? If so, has there been any forgiveness of that borrowing? And what column are we collecting under? As I recall, we used to have about five different columns of percentage that we collected. What what are the what are the numbers there? And I'll take an answer from anybody who has it. Go ahead, Cameron. <laughs> um, <Please>. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. So uh, I'll try to be very quick. Um, we do have a, uh, a trust fund report that is due uh, January 31st. And so, um, you know, Representative Kitzmiller, your, your committee, House Commerce Committee, um, will, will be one of the recipients of that report and, and also just mentioning it for the GovOps Committee if they're interested. Um, our trust fund is a little under half of where we were at the beginning of the pandemic. We had uh, a little over 500 million dollars in our trust fund now we're down to around 200 um, 220 to 30 million um, so we have not borrowed we are very fortunate in having the, the fund that we had prior to the pandemic 
We were one of the most adequately funded trust funds in the country. USDOL actually had us ranked as number one as far as having the necessary funds in our in our UI trust fund across the country. Um, so we we are in a, a stable position. And uh, we have not had to borrow one of the few states that have not. I think, um, Commissioner, I think it's around 40% of the states maybe have had to borrow or in a pre-authorization of borrowing status. So, um, and to your second question, Representative Kitzmiller, it, we are in the lowest tax schedule right now. Uh, you are correct. There are five different tax schedules. Uh, schedule five being the highest, schedule one being the lowest. And we did go down to schedule one in July of 2020. And that gets into a uh, very complex uh, formula and conversation as to how tax rates are scheduled uh, or set. And, and if, um, if either of the chairs want us to go down that road or if there are any specific questions, we can go down that road. Um, but we are currently in the lowest tax schedule and we hit that this past uh, July. That's the first time we've hit tax schedule one since the last recession. So there was a, a lot of work that was done over the past 10 plus years by employers to help build the fund back up. Um, and we were finally able to hit tax schedule one. Um, you know, uh, I think people could argue uh, there isn't a, a more appropriate time given everything going on, but we are at the lowest tax schedule currently. I, re I remember those days. That's back when I was on Commerce yes, before and Representative Mark Codd and I spent a lot of time working on how we would dig ourselves out of this hole. It leads me to a follow-up question. We all know there are a handful of states that are, I will call them bad actors in, in the whole UI trust fund thing. California, Illinois uh, come, come to mind that just are so far underwater, they will likely never dig their way out of that. And in the middle of all of this, are there any thoughts of forgiving any of that? So I would be kind of ticked off if, if these mm -hmm. terrible states that have just used it the wrong way, mm -hmm. they're up at schedule five and they know they're never going to catch up. Right. Um, geez, I'd hate to see tax dollars go to bailing out these people who did absolutely the wrong thing over decades. Right. Uh, yes, sir. So there are states, um, you know, that, that, you know, traditionally do not build up a UI trust fund. Um, you know, I think they would argue that their goal is to try to keep employer taxes low. That would be their argument. Um, but in these situations, they have to borrow, uh, you know, in California situation, you know, billions of dollars from the U.S. government in order to, to pay their UI uh, obligations. Um, the federal government has extended, I, I'm not sure if they extended it through 2021, but I know through calendar year 2020, they did waive interest payments on any borrowing. Um, again, I don't know if that has been extended. We could find out. What I can tell you is there has been some conversation at the federal level. I, I don't want to say at like the, the Congress, the congressional level. There's been conversations among our state partners uh, about just relieving the funds, all to, relieving the loans altogether and making them grants instead of loans. And I can tell you that in the conversations I've had, I've been one of the first and, and, and other states in our situation uh, have raised our hand to say um, that would not be equitable to the states like Vermont who have put in the hard work to get a trust fund that has been adequate to serve us in times like this. And states that have been the good actors, the states that have put in the hard work to build up our trust funds and did not need to borrow uh, should not be penalized or should be given some sort of recognition in that moment. So I, I will recognize Representative Kitzmiller that that is, um, that's a conversation that happens and it's a conversation that as it goes forward, we do raise our hand to say, you know, we put in the hard work and, um, you know, if you're going to 
you know, bail out states in that type of way, uh, then states like Vermont should be given something uh, to recognize what we've been able to do over the past 10 years to build up our fund and not have to be in a situation where we needed to borrow. So we, we could, are aware of that. Maybe they could forgive us for half an amount that they're forgiving California. Right. That right. would set for probably the next 75 years. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Kitzmiller, and you're correct. There's been, uh, uh, it was difficult on businesses and difficult on employees as well um, in order for us to get that, that trust fund built up the way we did. But we all persevered. We stuck to the plan and thank God we did. And yeah. even when we did, did come up with the plan, um, we never anticipated anything like this. No, for true. But the, everybody did the right thing. That was a wonderful agreement from all parts. But real quick, Mr. Chair, I was just I was able to pull the numbers up very quickly. As of uh, January fourth, California has borrowed nearly eighteen billion dollars. Illinois has had to borrow uh, over three billion dollars. Um, so there are. Um, you know, it looks like New York has had to borrow over nine billion dollars. Um, so, how about New Hampshire? Uh, let's see. Um, I don't think New Hampshire has had to. Um, they have not, as far as I can see. But um, yeah. Oh, good. Thanks, uh, Representative Nigro. Uh, thank you. Um, the earlier comments about the different perspectives involved with every claim, uh, that certainly makes sense to me. And, and presumably, when a constituent approaches us uh, saying they haven't received payment from unemployment, presumably some of those folks at the end of the day simply aren't eligible and, and either don't understand that or, um, or, or disagree with it. Uh, but I, I'm curious. Of the adjudicated claims, if you could give some sense of how many of those um, are being found in favor of the claimant, and if that's and whatever your answer to that is, how that compares to prior to the pandemic. So um, I'm thinking in terms of so. Before the pandemic, I remember asking this question to our one of our um, adjudication staff, and they had said roughly 50% of all claims that whether they're initial or uh, continued weekly claims, about 50% roughly go into adjudications. So you can imagine given the volume that came through, having 50% of those go into adjudications. There was a lot of work done on the front end um, to keep claims out of adjudication. So I think it was probably much less than that, um, given some of the workarounds that were put into place. I don't know of those, especially during the pandemic, of those that went into adjudications, how many uh, are determined to be eligible in the end. The problem is you, you don't know the determination without the additional fact finding that occurs. And so I'd love to be able to say, you know, well, if we just made this adjustment in the initial um, steps of the, of the eligibility, eligibility process, could we just keep them out of adjudications altogether? Um, but sometimes you don't know that it's gonna result the way it does until, for instance, uh, when someone receives severance pay or they see, receive vacation pay, um, they have to attest to what they earned for that pay. Um, we, regardless of whether what they provided is true and accurate, that case will go to adjudications because under the law, we have to validate what they report against what the employer reports. Uh, and so in those cases, there's nothing wrong with the claim in and of itself, but we have to validate because we have to say, okay, this is what the claimant claims they receive in severance pay. Does that match what the employer says they provided? And then we have to equate that to some, uh, some term, P 
period. So does it equal a week's worth of pay? Does it equal two, six, or 10 weeks worth of pay? Because that is what we consider offsetting remuneration. So in those senses, we would have to then determine for how many weeks are we offsetting someone's benefits because they got paid severance when they left their employment. So that's an example of there's not always something wrong with the claim. Um, I want to say that I, that more often than not, um, at least you know, in the majority, we end up determining a an adjudicated claim to be an eligible claim, um, which I think is good news. It means that there's more people out there being afforded benefits during this this time. Um, but some, but they go to adjudications because that's how the system was designed. Um, and it really is either based on the way they answered a question because we have to validate the answer they gave um, or because we received maybe different information from the employer. So if we ask them both for information and the claimant says this and the employer says that, and if they don't match up, then we have to adjudicate the claim. Um, so there's a, there's a whole series of reasons why claims end up in adjudications and go through additional fact finding. Cameron, anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, sir. Uh, you know, I, I I don't know how challenging it would be to try to get that answer, but I think the commissioners identified it. It can be really nuanced. Um, a, a lot of times, it could be you're denied for just this week, or you're denied for this amount of money, but then you're eligible after that. So it. Um, yeah, so it's not always a straight denial or a straight right. eligible answer. Right. So, and, and maybe part of my question also is then the further, because you talked about the layers of appeal process and, and maybe, you know, how that relates to, to folks that appeal, but presumably some of those appeals are probably continuing to ongo because you said that to, to continue up the ladder of appeals could take six months to, to a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it, again, it takes about... Um, you know, 60 to 90 days. Again, we receive this seasonal flood every year in the winter. Um, so we're seeing the appeal time lapse increase because of that seasonal push. Um, but, you know, it could take anywhere from 60 to 90 days before you have your hearing in the, the level one of the appeal process, right? And part of that is because there are appeal rights given to both, to any, um, party with an interest in the claim. Um, and, and in many cases, it's the claimant who's appealing, but there are times when it's the employer that's contesting the reason someone was made eligible. Um, so we may deem an, a claimant to be eligible because they say um, they were laid off and the claimant and the employer then contest the claim because they say, no, this person quit. I'll be honest, when I was the deputy of the department, I sat uh, as the chair of the Employment Security Board, and um, which is fascinating, by the way, um, you know, seeing the claims and the details with the claims. But usually the, usually the answer or the truth is somewhere in the middle, um, and it's not very black and white. So, you know, it's the claimant saying, well, I never got a call back, so I figured I was fired. And the employer saying, well, the person, you know, I didn't fire them, but they never showed back up to work. And so then there's this question, this gray area of were they, did they quit or were they fired? Um, and that's usually the part that ends up being worked out in the appeal process. Um, so, it, you know, then it goes to the employment security board, which is the level two process. Again, those are those are actually, other than um, the one uh, DOL representative, um, they're two members of the public. And these individuals um, give up their two to three hours every Tuesday morning um, to hear claims uh, from either employers or claimants. Um, and, and there really isn't a way to expedite that. That is the, the legal process for hearing the step two uh, appeals. And then if they choose, either party can, can go before the Vermont Supreme Court uh, for the third level of appeal. Okay, uh, I think probably the last question, we're, we're getting close to three o'clock. Um, so Representative Anthony. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both, uh, Commissioner and Director. Um, my my um, 
how shall I say, uh, first uh, inclination when I see a set of facts or a scenario or a story is to try to bring some uh, logical uh, threads to bear. And so when I hear what's been described today as the challenges, uh, I say to myself, well, <clears throat> um, what we see in the last eight months isn't an accident. Uh, that is to say, it was, it was almost preordained. And I think uh, both of you in different ways have almost conceded that. And so I say to myself, so, so who wanted this? <laughs> And you also have used the analogy of essentially a tripartite set of stakeholders, and you've identified them, I think, justly as the, the um, uh, executive and legislative branches of Vermont. That's, I consider those to be uh, one contributor uh, uh, unified in some sense. Then there's the employer community. Then there's obviously the employee. So if you ask yourself, so who amongst those three participants wanted this disaster or benefited? Uh, I have to say, certainly, uh, I think sensibly you could discard the employees. I can't imagine any employee who finds themselves um, in a situation that you've described would have thought that that was a good outcome. So really the default settings, the level of complexity, the state overlay over the federal requirements are all human constructs. And so I guess I, going forward, I wanna say, so what is it that we should do since uh, only two stakeholders uh, arguably could have possibly benefited from from what we're seeing around us, and it's not employees. So what is it, what's our responsibility? Where do we go from here? I don't think it's as simple as uh, plugging in a new mainframe. And by the way, I think there are some states that have used, as you described, ancillary activities, which have much more uh, expansive flexibility, not using mainframes, that is to say clouds. So while mainframes may be part of the discussion because we have an old piece of junk, that's not going forward where the only uh, discussion should lie. So I guess I'm, I'm going in two ways. The human element is we constructed the complexity. We created the defaults. We decided the checks don't go. That's the default. And by the way, the Department of Transportation, the Department of uh, Economic Development and Community Affairs, uh, the Department of um, almost you name it in the state of Vermont couldn't operate uh, with the level of complexity and the defaults as you've described them. So it's something very unusual, I think. Uh, it couldn't, we couldn't do business with this level of complexity or defaults in any other branch of government. So I, I think really this is an outlier and we really should pay attention to why we created this complexity and the default settings as we have. Thank you. If I could, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I absolutely agree uh, with the representative. Um, from that perspective, if you were to ask me um, whether my, my position on modernization has changed, um, from February to now, I would say yes. Um, and in some ways, I think, you know, if I try to find the silver lining in everything, um, the pandemic has opened our eyes to what our true needs are going to be going forward. Um, because I think if we had built a modernized system in 2019, I'm not sure we would have been much better off based on the direction we were heading. Um, the system may have been more secure and it may have been more stable. Um, but it was still built around administering one program, the unemployment insurance program. Uh, and really now what we're talking about is how do we build a system that can meet the flexibilities of what has come out of this pandemic, which is how do you create a modular a system that can be that can stand up multiple programs in a very short period of time 
um, but can all work hand in hand, can all meet the federal requirements, can all meet the federal reporting requirements um, and, and still function. So flexibility um, is gonna be the name of the game in terms of modernization going forward. Um, I think the other piece I would add to that is um, there are components um, that have really prevented us. Modernization is one. Um, I think we're gonna have to find a solution to the funding issue. Um, and I don't know long-term whether we can um, res reside solely on or operate solely on uh, federal funding. Um, we may have to find another mechanism for um, uh, supporting administrative functions within the UI program. We were already having this conversation before the pandemic. The pandemic just highlighted it, and fast-tracked it, but we knew that we couldn't continue to operate on the budget that was being provided to us by the feds, um, you know, going forward in the long term. Um, I think the other component too, um, to Representative Anthony's uh, point, uh, and I don't know, um, I don't know the answer to this, but one of the one of the issues that has made this uh, UI so much different than all of those other uh, areas and our ability to respond more quickly to the needs of our constituents. And the thing that has held us back is um, a blatant unwillingness by the federal government and specifically the US Department of Labor to provide any flexibility in how eligibility criteria are um, defined and uh, implemented and used or the the ability to um, stop non-critical functions in UI to focus on claim processing, or the fact that you know, in the end, um, you know, we are accountable to the Office of Inspector General, uh, and they were also provided an additional thirty million dollars. I think it was like twenty-six point something million dollars, just to conduct oversight and enforcement. Um, and so, you know. Part of our problem in responding um, was was not was not solely on us. Um, you know, part of that was our inability to be innovative and uh, creative um, and still meet the criteria set forth uh, by the federal government in order to continue to receive uh, administrative funding and benefits. So, you know, when when people talk about you know, essentially just tossing the federal requirements aside, um, there are there are severe um, implications that come with that, in, up to and including a loss of um, the federal eligibility for benefits. So we could have lost PUA funding, we could have lost FPUC funding, we could have lost PEUC funding, we could have been uh, forced as a state to repay any of those funds that were um, dished out for administrative or benefit dollars. Um, and at times you could even say, you know, blatant disregard could result in a loss of the state to even operate a UI program. Um, and obviously I think many states found themselves and we took necessary risks to make sure um, we, we didn't get caught up in too much of a, a quandary, but, um, that is one of the biggest challenges we have faced. And we have vo voiced that frustration um, to the US Department of Labor on multiple occasions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Anything that you would uh, like to ask or weigh in on before we say goodbye? Well, I just want to say I appreciate very much uh, having a good two hour block of time. Um, I know how precious your hours are and, and how hard um, you folks are working. And so I appreciate you giving us this opportunity and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue on how to um, how to support your department in uh, delivering the services that Vermonters are really relying on. I will, um, and I, I just want to extend my thanks to both committees. Um, you know, I will echo what uh, Representative Mulvaney Stanick mentioned, which is, um, you know, the 
the constituent or the claimant is really the focal point of all of this. And, um, you know, it, it is our charge to make sure that those individuals that are eligible for benefits get their benefits in a timely manner. And, and we continue to strive to do that. It's not always easy. Um, I, I think it also creates a, a challenging position um, for folks in our UI uh, area and myself included um, because everybody is likely deserving of some type of support. Um, and, and they are all coming to us with incredible um, needs uh, and, and um, disparaging situations. And unfortunately, we don't always have the ability to take all those factors into consideration when um, determining eligibility. Um, but it is something I think that weighs heavy on our staff uh, every time we do have to deny somebody. Um, and, and luckily we've been able to broaden our eligibility um, to make more people uh, eligible for benefits. Um, but, but to what Representative Mulvaney Stanick said, you know, we continually look at this at, with an eye on the claimant um, and serving the, the claimant and, and constituents. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner, Director Wood. Um, we appreciate your time. Um, we know how valuable it is. Um, I think this was a good discussion, um, especially for new members of both committees. And um, I hope uh, the, uh, the older members of GovOps um, were interested in the wonderful world of unemployment insurance. Um, it's something that we've, uh, that we've uh, been going through for uh, many, many years. And um, I think uh, as Representative Kitzmiller was talking about the last time that we were in the uh, uh, having problems with the system and and the plans that we put into place, um, where both uh, employers and employees were were harmed, um, but we also recognized at that point that it's it was the employers who took on the bulk of of the problem um, and that's the way it should be. It's an insurance program for employers. Um, and so um, I think we continue to focus in that direction that this is uh, something that, that we watch out, make sure that our employees are taken care of when they lose their jobs through no fault of their own. And it's a system that's set up for us uh, to make sure that um, people that do lose their jobs have some income to survive on. Um, but we also uh, continue to work, and I know the department works hard, uh, to make sure that those people get back on the job as soon as they can. Um, because I think we all know the longer that people stay unemployed and stay disconnected from the workforce, um, the more apt they are to not re-enter the workforce. So um, uh, again, thank you for all your work and thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of GovOps for joining us this afternoon and I hope we can do it again. And uh, everyone have a good weekend.